<laughs> welcome to the Engineering with Rosie live stream and welcome also to today's guest, uh, Jeremy Barnes. You might be able to see a slight family resemblance there because he is my brother. Cool. So I Hi, like everyone. To... <laughs> Sorry. So I like to start every live stream to ask by asking um, where's everybody calling in from today? I'm still trying to figure out exactly where the uh, like right time to do these is given the global nature of all of us. Oh, we've got someone, David Montgomery, calling in from Huntington Beach, California. I've actually been there. I went swimming there one time. That's very nice. Cool. Yeah. So everybody tell me, tell me where you're calling in from. Um, I just want to start by thanking the sponsor of this live stream, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, and remind you all that you can uh, download the latest podcast and sign up for the weekly tech news um, newsletter in the description. So, yeah, like I mentioned, we've got a guest today, um, Jeremy Barnes. Um, today's topic is going to be on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and how these technologies are going to impact the, um, the clean energy transition. So I did put a... Um, I put a poll up on the community page um, last week asking artificial intelligence is going to affect the clean and in the clean energy transition in this way. Um, 11% say the energy transition can't happen without it. 60% say it's got potential to solve some problems. Um, and then 29% say AI is a buzzword that people use to sound fancy, nothing more. So, Jeremy, what do you think about the 29% of people that think that your entire career is a fancy buzzword and nothing more? <laughs> I would say that they're they're probably right in that uh, <laughs> anyone anyone who orients himself towards what everyone is talking about is going to end up uh, you know uh, intersecting with buzzwords at some point. So I think beyond the buzzwords, though, there is a serious base of uh, of real technology and real potential there. I think the problem is trying to separate what people say about it, especially people who are uninformed. Uh, and tend to often exaggerate the potential impact from what is possible today and also what is potentially possible tomorrow, but we're not there yet. And so, you know, some people say things that will be available in 10 years, like they'll be available tomorrow, uh, you know, that kind of gives it a whole buzzwordy sense. And so a lot of it is really just sorting out what's real today, what might we be able to do later on, and to stay a little bit away from the buzzwords and say, hey, we're engineers, we have real problems to solve. How do we go about taking these tools and uh, and using them for something practical and productive? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a good summary and definitely um, ties in well with kind of the focus of this channel where I'm always, uh, you know, trying to figure out what's uh, an exciting technology that's coming up now and what's, you know, just a, a lab result that's been published like it's, you know, going to solve all our problems but won't really. So I, uh, I just also wanted to get you to start, Jeremy, by telling us a little bit about your background, really, really briefly. Um, I know that you, um, you went to the same university as me a little bit beforehand. You got a computer science degree and a systems engineering degree, which is the one that I have. Um, can you tell us a bit about, yeah, why you chose that and um, why you got into the field that you have and, yeah, what you've been doing? <laughs> Yeah, well, as you say, I went to uh, Engineering with Rosie University as well, <laughs> uh, a, a, a little bit before you, but, uh, you know, similar course. So it's interesting that having studied exactly the same thing, uh, our, uh, you know, our career paths have been extremely different. Uh, so I went uh, and decided to start a startup, uh, did that in April of 2000, which was just the worst possible moment you could ever imagine for starting a startup because a whole dot-com crash happened like right afterwards. And that ended up taking me to uh, Montreal. Uh, I worked in that startup for about nine years. It was a natural language startup as a uh, technical lead and research lead there. Uh, after that, I moved on. Uh, I founded several companies, uh, moved from a CTO role to a CEO role for a few years, and eventually sold my companies kind of in succession um, you know, sold a company to a company who then sold it to another company. And I eventually ended up, I now work for a company called ServiceNow, which is a large uh, American multi multinational corporation. And so I've covered everything from the business side, the entrepreneurial side, 
but I also still spend, uh, you know, I'm unhappy if I'm not spending any time in the technical part. And so I still write code and, you know, I try to get my hands dirty with it. So I wouldn't say I'm the deepest uh, in terms of uh, my my knowledge. I, in, I interact and I have colleagues who, you know, invent these amazing algorithms, which I would, you know, today struggle to uh, to, to understand or to be able to, to, uh, to, to you know, to contribute to. But uh, in terms of the you know the big picture and how insects are markets and things like that, I've had a lot of experience there. And I'd also say that my you, the big speciality I have, which is not a great speciality, is I've always been way too early in all of the companies I've founded. And so there's nothing more painful than founding a company too early for the market. And I've managed to do it in every single case so far. <laughs> so uh, you know, in terms of uh, yeah, sorry, someone asked me to speak slower. In terms of <laughs> the experience that I've had, uh, a lot of it has been learning things the hard way by trying an idea before it's time. And AI certainly, when I first started looking at it more than 20 years ago, it was an idea which was not quite ready. And it's been really interesting to see it become ready now. Okay, um, that's good. That's a good segue into the, you know, the bulk of the, the topic today, which is how um, artificial intelligence is going to be able to impact the energy transition. And uh, I mean, I don't, it feels like, uh, to me, it kind of feels like we're late, if anything. I haven't seen a lot of artificial intelligence in the energy transition. So maybe this is the right time for you to, <laughs> for you to move into renewable energy and the clean energy transition. So, um, like I mentioned, we uh, had that poll where, uh, yeah, I'll share it again. Um, oops. So, yeah, 60% of people think it's got potential to solve some problems and then got a lot of suggestions about what those um, what those kind of interesting problems would be. There's definitely a lot there. Um, it kind of tended to cluster around three main groups, Um which is smart grids. So that includes like demand response, virtual power plants, um, weather forecasting, and then what that's going to enable us to do in terms of you know predicting predicting prices better and maybe trading. And then three, managing assets. Um, so that includes predictive maintenance and battery operation. There are also there are also lots of other interesting topics like. Um, design and manufacturing and the way AI can help with that. And I think that might be a good one for another live stream if Jeremy will agree to come back. And then also the environmental impact of AI and other high performance computing like blockchain. I think that can be a whole episode on its own. So I won't be covering those today. So um, I just also wanted to mention that we've got really um, a really nice diverse audience today coming calling from all over i kind of thought this time would only suit um, people in north and south america but we've also got um london diego um muhammad from egypt philip from ireland lorenzo from genoa italy where i've also been and it is so nice there um jacob from luxembourg Actually, many more from um, <laughs> from Europe than from the US. So that's interesting. Okay. Oh, and um, Australian as well. David, hi. <laughs> All right. So, Jeremy, can we start off by really briefly just saying what what is AI? And I think also importantly, what isn't? Because, um, you know, I personally see a lot of things described as AI that I'm like, oh, really? It doesn't sound, <laughs> it doesn't sound that, you know, uh, that out there. So yeah, can you, can you tell us what's what's AI? What can it and what can't it do? Yeah. So AI at its essence is some very simple mathematics, which everyone learned in high school, which is differentiation and uh, using differentiation for optimization. And it's applied over uh, these kinds of mathematical functions, which have a very, very large number of parameters. And AI really these days is about creating these functions which can approximate something without knowing necessarily what the system is. So instead of saying, well, I know that this is a, you know, let's say that we have a wind turbine, I know that its you know, power response is dependent on the frequency of the oscillation and, you know, uh, modeling it out explicitly. What you do with AI is you take measurements of all of the inputs 
and you take measurements of the thing that you want to uh, you know, be able to predict. And then you can train algorithms, which using that data are able to infer the function, which links the two together. So it means that things which you could potentially model out, but are very hard for whatever reason with sufficient data, you can actually uh, model those things out. And so really it's a way of saying, instead of creating a model of the system, an explicit model of the system, I'm going to create an implicit model of the system where the model is defined by the data that I have, that I uh, collect and the response that I observe. And the techniques really for just doing that, that's the essence of AI. You have input, you have output, the link between the two, instead of creating an explicit model, you do it uh, by learning a function. And so, and it uses very simple mathematics, incredibly simple mathematics. The interesting part is it uses huge numbers of parameters. And because of the power of computers that we have today, it's able to, and the uh, structure of the models, it's able to actually learn uh, your sometimes incredibly good approximations to the, the underlying function and often much simpler than the your model of this system that you would actually have. So that's in the essence what it is. Now, how it's used is really, it's a different way of generating software. If you want software, which is going to say, optimize a particular system, you need to understand how that system is gonna to respond to the uh, impetus or the situations or the control signals that you give it. You can use AI in order to learn that function there. And so instead of creating code explicitly to generate it, you collect a data set in order to generate it and you allow AI to create that function. That's the that's the kind of the, the positive spin on it. And it's, you know, AI, one of the nice things about AI is it's their functions there are known as universal approximators. So they actually can learn any function. That's a mathematical property of them, which is nice. The downside of it is that because you don't have a model of the system, you are entirely dependent on the data. And this is where people make the mistakes is assuming that uh, the data is the truth. Data is rarely a true representation of the system. And not only that, the other mistake people make is by putting AI into a context where they don't consider the larger system around it. AI is always part of a system. If you have a stimulus and a response and you have a control system, you can't just model the stimulus and the response. You have to understand how the rest of the system is going to then react because that'll affect the, the overall state of it. And so you know, yeah, that's the other big issue with AI is that because you don't have to do the modeling exercise, you're often blind as to what is actually going on uh, inside the system. Okay, that's, um, yeah, that raised a point that a few people made in that um, community post as well, the poll, that it all relies on the data and, uh, you know, people maybe rely too much on the artificial intelligence and maybe not on the natural intelligence that's kind of needed to complement it at least. Yeah, so I just have a couple of questions about um, maybe is this AI or isn't it AI? So the first one is um, my PhD <laughs> project actually, which, um, uh, well, now, I have to, now I'm going to have to remember what it was about enough to describe it. But basically uh, it was on composite um, structural design, so a wind turbine blade design. And um, because composite materials are very complicated with, you know, so many parameters, it's hard to optimize a whole structure. So I, um, I made an algorithm that would automatically generate a design and I made like 20,000 different designs in this way and, um, and yeah, and analyze them and then um, used data mining techniques to figure out which were the important design parameters um, and used an evolutionary algorithm to kind of breed the, the most successful designs to make baby wind turbine blade designs that were more successful. Um, is, that, is that artificial intelligence? Yeah, that fits within the, that definitely fits within the, the practice of what artificial <laughs> intelligence is today. Uh, because the, the important part there is the evolutionary uh, algorithm. And so, you know, all artificial intelligence algorithms, they work or they learn by optimizing some kind of an objective function 
and they you know they change the parameters of the system in order to improve that objective function and there are different ways of doing that and there are different ways of uh you know creating a model and things like that but they all have those same characteristics the field of artificial intelligence that that most looks like today is uh something uh, called reinforcement learning so uh you know a lot of the interesting uh yes you did just say baby wind turbine <laughs> design um but a lot of the uh the systems uh you know that people are trying to optimize today you actually have to make decisions kind of about what strategy to adopt where it's actually quite expensive to eventually evaluate the design and figure out you know was it good or not you know if rosie had of built 20,000 wind turbines she would have had no time to 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 go on youtube and so you know you guys would all be doing something else right so um yeah so that you know ai is often used in order to improve the design process but we've we've agreed not to talk about that today so we'll, yeah we'll get i to did that just in another just meeting. realized i i veered us off onto the direction i said we weren't going to go okay then just one other question i um i have a video coming out later this week about um using satellite data to monitor gas flares um and i'll just share that as well so you can see so it uses this night fire algorithm where they measure the temperature of um, pixels in yeah from satellite data and figure out if it's you know what the the um, the cause of the temperature anomaly is. They're trying to you know differentiate between like a bushfire and or any kind of biomass burning and a gas flare. Um, I think I have a better image of that. Yeah, so they're looking at the the temperature and the um, yeah, and the how many pixels there are at that temperature. Is is this artificial intelligence then? Because they've got to interpret um, satellite images. So it's probably yeah, it, artificial intelligence, as you say, is a little bit of a marketing term. The question is really, are they using the data? in order to learn something that couldn't be figured out in a different way so you know for example that now there's a, a fair, the line is not clear between the two uh you know for example in uh, at my previous company we created an optical character recognition engine and the best algorithm to figure out was there a word there or not you know you can kind of if you squint you can find words in clouds you can find words in you know <laughs> roads and you can find words all over the place the best algorithm to figure out if a word was there or not was a very simple algorithm based on you know essentially the same thing looking at the number of pixels uh, of similar colors around and so that was part of a very sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithm but that particular part of it, you know, maybe wouldn't be considered to, to be so. So I think the, you know, it's an artificial distinction. It's not particularly helpful. I think the question is, does it solve the problem? And if you use a more complicated algorithm than you need to solve a problem, just to be able to call it AI, you're not really helping anyone except maybe your marketing department there. <laughs> okay so let's um let's move on to the topics then which we said we're going to cover and um, we're just going to format this um by doing a little explanation of what the topic is and then i want to hear questions from um viewers because yeah that's the benefit of the live format obviously so the first topic will be smart grids um i'll just i've got found this little video which i'm going to play um Oh, you can see that. Yeah, so basically this um, that first part of the animation was showing uh, the energy just coming from the from the big centralized power plant flowing through the houses. And then that's yeah, that's that's the old dumb dumb grid and then the smart grid, it's got smart components, um, smart devices inside the house and maybe there's some solar panels or some other electricity generation in the house and you know it's much more of a, a two-way, uh, flow happening so obviously that's a lot more complicated um yeah so that's that's my quick explanation jeremy what do what do you think about the potential for using ai here and then yeah please viewers write questions while jeremy's talking ai I, i've had some experience in seeing ai used uh, in the uh, power generation industry uh it's 
a hard problem to solve end to end with AI. And that's quite simply because a system is always a chaotic system. And so uh, you know, any effect that you have can create these kind of non-linear amplifications that ripple throughout the whole system. And things like that, you know, in the same way that weather is really hard to predict because a small perturbation in one place can have a big effect elsewhere, it's very hard to affect, especially when you know, people say, oh, the you know, electricity is not working well, maybe there's going to be a blackout, I'm going to turn on my heater you know, to get ahead of it or things like that. You know, people's actual behaviour changes there and no algorithm can predict that kind of chaotic behaviour in, in the system. So I'd say AI has its place uh, but AI has its place as a tool which is used in order to, uh, you know, forecast things with bounds in order to be able to evaluate what if scenarios so that the optimization algorithms can work better. And you know, in a whole kind, in a whole set of uh, more perceptive applications, you know, for example, AI is used by drones that fly along power lines. So I live in Canada. And as I see there's a few people here from Canada as well. You know, one thing that we have in Canada is lots and lots of power lines that are very, very long. And they're incredibly expensive to inspect manually. So drones can actually do as good a job or better than, than humans because they don't kind of get bored of it. And they're you know, not worried about accidentally touching a, a wire with 400,000 volts uh, you know, on the other side, things like that. So there are a lot of ancillary applications for for uh, AI there. I would say that the whole grid optimization and things like that, those are optimization problems. AI intersects with optimization because optimization is used to train AI and AI can be used in order to predict things with optimization, in particular with something called reinforcement learning I talked about earlier. You can actually uh, have AI systems discover new strategies of ways of managing things. But I wouldn't say that that problem can be solved by AI. AI, I'd say, is a, plays a supporting role, uh, but I don't think AI is going to be the uh, you know, major solution. It's like everything, it's a tool. You apply it where it's appropriate and it makes some problems easier. In other places, it has absolutely no application. Yeah, okay. Um, so that, that all makes sense. We've got some interesting comments from um, Lightning Rod. Canada has the most corrupt electricity grid ever, 15 times the power we ever need. So, I mean, I've got I've got no, no reason to have an opinion about that, but there are also some other interesting points from the same commenter that um, smart grids with local generation is the biggest improvement to 21st century life. And I also think that there's huge potential that we really have not scratched the surface on yet. Um, he also, or actually I don't know, he or she also <laughs> Um, comments that widely distributed facilities offer much greater efficiency and reliability. And there I would say definitely the potential to, but um, yeah, again, I, I just don't feel like we're, we've seen as much change as we're going to yet. Like I know that in Australia, in Victoria, everybody has smart meters now or over, I think about 95% of houses have smart meters. So with half hour metering and still 90 or more percent of people are on flat energy use tariffs so you know what's what's smart about that uh, nothing um yeah so i think that I, I think that a lot a lot more needs to be done maybe with the markets to enable these sorts of uh, advantages to come into play i also wanted to share one other um article because one of the other things about um Smart grids is the possibility of a virtual power plant. It's really small. Um, so virtual power plant is uh, a network of decentralized medium or small power generating units like wind farms and solar parks, but also um, solar systems on houses. Eventually it'll be vehicle to grid, that sort of thing as well. And so you, you end up with a lot of potential to be really dynamically matching supply and demand that uh, both of them are, you know, extremely variable and really fast. But the amount of information that you would need to process to get that working well is uh, is a lot. So it seems to me like that's a, a really, really huge aspect where artificial intelligence is uh, has got, you know, more to play than what's been going on so far. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, I think the 
It certainly does have more of a role, but there are prerequisites. And again, you can't just look at the artificial intelligence part by itself. You've got to look at the overall system. You talked a few times about timeframes, about 30-minute readings and about uh, daily energy markets and, and things like that. And that's really key because the uh, you know, any kind of a system uh, where people are reacting in real time, in order for smart control algorithms to work, if they're driven by AI or they're driven by something else, it doesn't matter, the feedback loop needs to be tight. And so if you can only adjust things once per day, but the people who are using the electricity are adjusting you know, instantaneously, you're never gonna be able to do a good job in managing it. So I think a lot of what is coming in place is things which enable that kind of fast, uh, you know, that fast reaction time. Now that doesn't mean it's gonna be solved. You look at the system with the fastest reaction time, it's probably high frequency trading markets where people literally, you know, they try to shorten their cables by one foot to get the, that tiny, tiny difference of uh, you know, speed to, to get the signal into the market there. Mm. They still have flash crashes, uh, you know, sudden market movements that no one understands, everything like that. So that's not going to solve the problem all by itself. It's going to mean it can be more reactive. Uh, but it also creates more arbitrage opportunities and it's going to create a whole set of different problems there where people, you know, especially uh, time arbitrage, where you can react on a faster time scale than the system uh, you know, is measuring. That's going to cause all kinds of uh, interesting issues too. And probably the last thing we want is a flash crash in the electricity grid, which you know has a potential to cause a huge amount of infrastructure damages as well. So your know, artificial intelligence there, it has its place, but it's not going to make things better or worse by itself. It has to be part of an overall system design. And I think when people ask the question about AI, they're assuming that AI can be the system. It can't. The system has to be designed around it. It can't be designed uh, just with AI in place. Mm, that's really interesting. And it reminds me of something I talked about when I, I did a video with Octopus Energy, who have a flexi flexible electricity tariff. Um, so their customers are on a, you know, a varying tariff depending on what the energy price is, which usually when energy is cheap, it's because there's a lot of renewables in the, the grid. And they said they had this um, this electric vehicle tariff that enabled cheap charging uh, if you started charging after midnight. And they noticed that they were getting a big peak in usage exactly at 12. And so obviously, if you know, you can imagine that on a really large scale, then you're going to end up with, um, you're going to be causing the problem that you're trying to solve. And in the UK, the um, the energy prices, electricity prices are set 24 hours ahead of time. So it it would never be able to, you know, AI wouldn't, it sounds like AI wouldn't really be able to fix that system on its own. It's just, it's not set up right for AI to be able to, <laughs> to help that much. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, if you make a self-driving car uh, with AI in it, and then you decide to, uh, you know, not connect the brakes to anything, the AI <laughs> algorithm can't stop a car from crashing. Like it's, yeah. you know, there, there's not just a question of the algorithm itself, it's, you know, is it set up so they can actually succeed? And in that case there, it's, it's absolutely, uh, as you say, the no amount of AI is gonna be able to fix a single price over a 24 hour period, that's not gonna lead to people arbitraging. And as it gets on a bigger scale, you could imagine people saying, well, I'm going to store, I'm gonna add midnight, from midnight to four, I'm going to charge my batteries and they're going to sell the electricity back to the market at a different time to make you know, to, to make money off it. And so you'll see these kind of extra behaviors, these arbitrage uh, exploitation behaviors coming up, which are going to kind of defeat all of the uh, you know, optimizations you can do in the system. And you can't really design around those with AI. That's got to be, that's part of the economic modeling of the system and you know the the, the design of the overall system, including the people who are using it and trying to exploit it. Hmm. Okay, let's go back to some um, viewer questions then. From Rich, we have central generation is proven and comparatively straightforward. Distributed stuff is going to be more complex to model and manage. Um, so, I mean, I, I might start with the response that uh, 
that was definitely true that the old system was uh, simpler. It's definitely sim- simpler to understand, but we have to remember that usage has always varied uh, constantly and a little bit unpredictably. So we have always had more complexity in the system than people maybe realise. Um, but the fact is that you know, if we want to end up with the cheapest clean energy grid, then we are going to have to get smarter because, you know, unless you just overbuild battery storage to the point where, you know, you have more than enough energy available any time of the day, that would be very expensive, obviously. So, you know, if you if you want to get things reliable, clean and cheap, then I, I think that we're going to have to move away from the simplicity. Um, do you have any yeah. response, Jeremy? Well, I, I would say the you, you have a look at the the issues that we're having with uh, energy. Uh, a lot of them have not changed. You know, the generation of energy, in terms of making that more green, is going well. I would say you know, we we now are able to generate electricity. Uh, in many cases, uh, the most efficient option are is a renewable option. So that's great. But distribution is. It you know, was already the more difficult part. You look at the problems with distribution. You know, the most of the power outages are, are due to problems with the distribution network. The wildfires in California were caused by electricity distribution and the huge insurance costs and things like that. Distribution is a big issue, and I think that's the you know, that's probably a big part of the uh, the allure of a distributed storage and generation system is it makes the distribution part easier. Uh, you know, it's less, the distribution is less centralized. You you can, uh, especially if you can match demand, you know, to, um, you know, to storage and, and sort of the distribution is is more distributed. Uh, that's interesting. And you know, again, AI can play a part in that, you know, in terms of understanding, you know, how to optimize charge cycles to maximize the useful life in uh, understanding you know, how to ensure there's the most resilience in the system, uh, how to ensure that there's the most, uh, you know, the most backup capacity available, things like that. Uh, but it's not going to solve the problem by itself. You know, the AI isn't going to cause, uh, you know, the grid to become more reliable or things like that. It's a tool which can be used uh, in order to enable better designs of a reliable uh, storage and distribution system. Mm. Okay, a question from BK Nessheim. <laughs> With flat fees, you have more control and that's smart. And I think to me that explains the reason why we everybody isn't on a flexible tariff. It, uh, we're, you know, experiencing some teething problems and we saw in that Texas freeze everybody that was on a flexible or some people that were on a flexible tariff ended up with thousands of dollar electricity bills because, it, yeah, it, uh, I mean... Because the price went up high and they stayed connected and so they paid a lot of money for it. Um, I can see people want to avoid that and I, I don't think that it's a mature market yet. Well, I think the uh, putting consumers directly uh, in the you know, into the market, it's the same as uh, you know, allowing day traders to borrow a, you know, a huge amount of money uh, on a margin and you know, invest it where they want it's you know they're going to get burnt a lot of them are going to get burnt and you know you do need i mean especially because most electricity di- distribution is still uh you know quasi monopolies uh, from your know, government or or um your know, electricity companies which, which have a, a local monopoly uh, you know, exposing the consumers to all the risk is probably not the right thing. Like again, I think the yeah you know, the government probably does need to step in to to regulate the the market, um, but there probably is a way to use price signals in order to improve the efficiency of the um, you know to to modify people's behaviour. I mean, that's what a price signal is. If price goes up, people will consume less. And that can be a useful signal if you design it into the system to uh, make sure that the peaks are not as high and the troughs are not as low, uh, or that you can match, you know, when you have uh, sources which are unreliable, you know that you know, it's going to rain for three days, there's not going to be as much solar. You can you know, use that in order to influence people's behaviour. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. There's lots of more questions on this, but I think we better move on to the the next topic. Um, otherwise, we won't get through them all. So the next one is weather forecasting. So I mean, maybe it's not obvious, but um, to me, it's clear that weather forecasting and renewable energy they they go really hand in hand because now if you can predict the weather, then you can predict the price on um, electricity. So that's obviously got a lot of implications for um, grid stability, knowing how much electricity you can uh, generation that you can expect over you know coming hours, days, or even seasonally would be really nice to know ahead of time if you're going to have a really um, I think Europe had a really cold spring, which caused, you know, is one of the big causes of their problem with you know, really expensive gas prices and electricity prices now. Um, yeah. And also it's going to open up, like you were mentioning with the trading, energy trading, I think, is um, starting to become a lucrative, <laughs> a lucrative thing to be involved in. So, Jeremy, can you tell us what do you think about AI's potential on weather forecasting. Are we already seeing a difference? Um, and is seasonal forecasting going to be a thing? Yeah, that's interesting. The some of my uh, some of my colleagues uh, work a lot on forecasting of all those uh, kinds of things, and it's incredibly hard. And you know, can you please introduce me to a, whoever can actually predict the weather? because uh, I assume that they're actually controlling it. You know, I, it's almost something which is so hard to predict unless you can create it, you can't really uh, predict <laughs> you know, w w what you want it to be. And I think that's true. You know, that, that's more or less true in, in different places around the world. You know, some places uh, you, you're pretty sure how the weather's going to be. But certainly around here, um, you know, it, it's about as good as a, uh, slightly better than a coin toss, but a coin toss, but not much more than that. Uh, so you know, for predicting the weather, I'd say um, AI has potential uses, but it's more in terms of getting better signals that can be used in order to understand what's, what's going on. Um, you know, for example, um, there are, you know, this is this is a different, a completely different example. But uh, one company was able to use satellite images in order to count the number of cars in Walmart parking lots, and from that they were able to predict Walmart sales before they announced them to the market. Now that enabled them to, uh, you know, basically front run on the, um, you know, what would happen after they announced the results. And yeah, that was a really, really uh, good signal. So there are analogies with that, uh, you know, from things like, you can imagine that your know, satellite data, items like that, you would potentially be able to understand, uh, you know, this is looking like uh, some particular effect is happening, which, you know, you wouldn't be able to necessarily know, but by looking at enough data, you could get a sense that, you know, this grass species is not growing as much, it seems, from the satellite data, and every year that that's happened, it's been a particularly hot summer or something like that. Yeah, you know, the same way that ants go indoors before there's a storm, before you have any idea, it's like, oh, the, the ants are going inside, you know, I guess it's going to rain. Yeah, you know, there are probably signals like that out there somewhere. So again, it's not the, you know, it's more finding leading indicators uh, where I think you know, AI is able to untangle some of those things and you know notice things that no one would think to look for, mm -hmm. um, but you know I don't think you know, weather is a chaotic system and AI is not good at um, at predicting the particular behaviour. AI can predict the range of outcomes. It can do a good job at saying this is the distribution of possibilities, but in terms of choosing which one. Uh, you know, any chaotic system there, you make a tiny mistake, you know, it's completely, the, the, the answer changes enormously. Hmm. Okay, so I have found here an example of a company that um, are using AI on weather data um, with renewable energy. Um, so they they say that it falls into three three groups of the, the benefits that you can get from using their AI um, weather analysis so predicting energy supply developing better models to anticipate energy supply fluctuations with improved weather data inputs so i mean obviously if you know if it's going to be cloudy one day then you know that there's going to be less um, solar power available and yeah same with 
if you know if it's going to be windy or not. And the further out that you can predict, then, you know, the further out that you can plan. Um, so, you know, that can complement well if you have still got a mix of fossil fuel generators and um, low inertia uh, renewable en- energy generation like wind turbines and solar, then, you know, a, um, a coal power plant needs a, or a nuclear one needs a long time to ramp up. So y- you can get a more reliable grid that way and, you know, make money off no- that knowledge as well. Second one was interesting, improved site selection. Um, so m- maximizing what you get for your for your equipment if you locate your solar farm or your wind farm in the location that um, I guess that's historical where the data is saying is going to be the the, the best. Um, to me, that doesn't sound like it doesn't scream AI at me because I mean, obviously, people have been using. Um, all that weather data to site wind and solar farms ever since they started, you know, installing them anywhere. And then thirdly, balancing energy production, optimizing consumption and production predictions with historical weather pattern weather pattern analytics. So I mean, it's a it's a website for a commercial company, so it's obviously pretty vague on on how they're doing it. But um, yeah, I guess that's the the way that people are currently using. AI with weather to help. But, um, yeah, I mean, to me, I, I really feel like we've got to get those traders in who are, you know, the same people that are um, either making money off trading on Wall Street or whatever, get get all those same kind of brains and um, and know-how applied to matching the, you know, smart, smart grids with weather forecasting, you know, bringing all this information in together. And if you give people a way to make money, usually they will figure out the, you know, the most efficient way to run that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you've got to understand what you're designing for there. You know, certainly, I mean, AI does apply to all of those, uh, those things you've, you've mentioned there. You know, predicting uh, energy supply, particularly... Uh, a lot of companies, you know, having worked with some of them, they do have often some interesting kind of secret data sets that they use, which give them a better ability to predict than others. Um, and particularly when you're in a market, it's not really that you can predict well, it's you can predict better than others, which is important. So your know, AI does apply there. Site selection, uh, yeah. It's probably the you know, weak version of AI. I don't think you need uh, a, a lot there because typically you're going to assume that the historical, um, you know, what you've seen historically is going to continue to be true. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's a fairly simple AI pattern there. The thing, though, that's important is you've got to understand what you're optimizing for. People who are going to build algorithms to trade energy and things like that they're probably going to optimize for profit. And so what they're going to do is they're going to try to arbitrage the um, profit out of the system. And it's not going to make the system, it's going to make the price signal more efficient, but it's not going to make the grid necessarily work better. It's going to make the grid more profitable. And so you need to think in the system design about how you align the economic, economic incentives to make better algorithms with the overall efficiency of the system. You know, one example of that is uh, if you look at the mortgage market, banks make the most money off people who borrow the most they can and struggle to pay it back for a long time, but eventually pay it back. And so, you know, they make the most profit because those people miss payments, they have extra interest rates that come in, things like that. And so they end up paying more. So, you know, it's probably not great that the bank lends them this money to get there, but you know, they can they do it because that's where they're going to make the most money. It's the same thing. If you optimize a system for money, you're probably going to end up uh, making suboptimal decisions for the health of the grid and overall. So you do need to have the government step in and set the parameters around what the system is being optimized for. You need to have there needs to be a profit for people to do it, but you need to be careful how you design the economics. Mm, yeah, that's uh, that's a good point, and it's also, I mean, it's a more. The, I mean, the financial system is very important, and um, stock market is important, but the um, electricity grid is more important, and y- y- we couldn't tolerate the kind of crashes that you see every you know decade or so in the stock market. You couldn't <laughs> couldn't just have a crash in your electricity grid for a few months while some quirk worked its way out. 
Yeah, and what you would end up happening with the government would step in and so people would make money when things were going good and then when things were going bad, the government would have to step in. And mm. so if it's not designed properly, you get all the same problems with the financial system. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, i just go to some comments. I have one from Diego Vega. Do you think AI could be a good tool for optimising a small smart grid using anaerobic digesters, wind turbines, PV, combining data of weather, social behaviour of food waste production and demand? Thanks. Uh, that, yeah, Jeremy? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, certainly if you could predict when, the, you know, when a crazy scientist was going to... Um, uh, come back from the uh, to the future to the present, and you know, drain all the electricity from the grid. It would be good, um, but you know, AI could be used for that. But really, you'd have to say what is the what is the problem that you would want to be solving with AI. Um, you know, the question there is going to be what what you want to change, what behavior do you want to change. Like, are you going to say to people, you know, what you put in the um, anaerobic digester? Um, are you going to say, you know, whether to install a wind turbine here? It's like that. You need to understand the problems that you're unable to solve. You, you can probably guess where you want to put a wind turbine. Um, or you could try a few, you could do some tests, you know, for install a temporary one, you know, for a couple of weeks and have a good idea of where it could be. So the question is really, um, yes, AI could apply there, but what problem is it trying to solve? It's not going to solve. You need to understand the problem in order to, to set it up. Uh, in terms of things like social behaviour, um, you know, I personally think that's a slippery slope. Uh, you, know, you could start to understand you know, a lot of signals that you get from the you know, consumer world, the advertising world, credit card data, what they're buying and things like that and say, well, I think this person here is likely to buy a, you know, a new TV and so it's going to be more electricity that's used by the new TV or whatever and then you know, predict all that kind of thing. I think it's a slippery slope. You can always, a bit more data, you can always convince yourself that more data is going to do a better job, but you really need to understand, you know, what are you trying to, to you know, are you trying to create a surveillance system that happens to optimise energy or are you trying to optimise energy, you know, whilst uh, respecting other constraints and you need to make sure you get the balance right. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Next question uh, from Calico M. There are times with virtually zero renewables, other times when it's very high, it's not reliable for base load. To make it reliable would require enormous storage capacity. And then there was a response from Lightning Rod, enormous storage or just massively homogenized and distributed tied together with grid tied storage. So I guess that that uh, exchange there is basically just a summary of the, the energy transition, uh, right? So um, definitely Calico M is right that it's a lot simpler to to do it either with the you know the old um, the old centralized energy one way flow um, or you can kind of mimic that with renewables by having just huge amounts of storage and um, some other commenters have have mentioned about hydro recently and hydro is interesting because it's renewable energy that behaves very similar to um, to you know fossil fuel generation or it can it can also be very flexible if you're using it for pumped storage as well so yeah I thought I think that that's that's where all the interesting part is of the the energy transition how do we it's like a new a new way of achieving the same thing, which is a reliable grid, but so much more complicated and dynamic. Yeah, and I think the for me the essential um, debate there is, which is the hardest part, is it matching um, generation, you know, matching supply and demand over time, or is it distribution? Each of mm -hmm. them, you know, solve one and make the other one harder to some extent. And so, you know, the question is, what's the right what's the right balance? And I think we'll gradually work out better ways of doing both and, uh, you know, it'll improve uh, rapidly over time. Mm. 
Okay, so let's move on to the last topic we're going to cover, which is asset management, um, which would include predictive maintenance, um, operation optimization, and also like battery op- operation, which um, has also been raised in the comments before. So predictive maintenance, they are, this is probably the one thing I hear most um, referred to with AI in, at least with wind energy um, and probably renewables in general. So what predictive maintenance is, is looking at the data that you've got to see if there are, you know, tells ahead of time that something is about to fail and then you can replace it. So some of the normal ways to do that are like looking at the SCADA data. So that's the data that the wind turbine controller is collecting, um, stands for supervisory control and data acquisition. So it collects a bunch of different um different parameters and it actually it varies from turbine to turbine exactly what they're capturing but it might be like the rotor speed the power production the pitch angle of the blade um, also stuff like shaft torque oil temperature and they can use some of those things to predict you know if a, a gearbox is about to to fail then some interesting ones that I've heard on heard of and um, worked on a little bit as well uh, using new kinds of data to um, to predict failures so that you can install um, uh, I can't think of the word <laughs> now you can measure the frequency that the blade is vibrating and when that changes it might be a suggestion that there's a structural problem for example or you can also see um, if the weight of the blade has changed because you know maybe there's ice all over it um, I've also heard of, uh, I don't know if it's actually happening, but I've heard of the potential that you can look at the frequency to see um, ahead of time if one of the ball bearings has broken and then you can, um, you know, replace that before it becomes a, a huge problem. Um, what are some other ones I've seen? Oh, they're also doing a lot now of structural inspections using drones. So the drones will fly up and down the blade and look at images, um, use AI to interpret whether there's defects or not. It's not maybe as reliable as um, some people would like it to be yet, but it's, you know, it's saving, it, it, it makes more inspections, more frequent inspections possible and makes it a bit cheaper. Um, and then there's also this Australian company, Ping, who install little listening devices on the, um, like the on the towers that can actually hear when there's a change in the the sound that the um, the blade makes when it passes the tower, and they can hear if there's some like leading edge damage or something. So, yeah, th- those are the interesting things that I've heard of. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, predictive maintenance is a relatively uh, common and you know mostly solved application for AI. It's been, people have been using that for a long time now, but you know, it's helped that there are interfaces like SCADA, which uh, use, you know, it's not just the wind turbines, it's, um, you know, in production lines, uh, things like that, there's SCADA data available from, you know, even Formula One race cars, there's SCADA data available uh, from them. So, you know, that common interface there enables, um, you know, has enabled those kinds of algorithms to be built uh, in a relatively, uh, you know, a relatively similar way. The interesting application of AI is in the things which people can still do, uh, but, you know, it's not represented in the data. So as you say, you know, someone who's been around engines for a long time, they can listen to the engine and they can get a pretty good idea. Okay, the timing's off here. And I think, you know, the oil, there's a the wrong oil, it's too thick. And, you know, they can kind of just by listening to it, they can figure out all of those kinds of things. So it's much less expensive to put a microphone or an accelerometer on something, you know, especially if, I mean, in a lot of cases, you can just strap, literally just strap a smartphone to it or, you know, embed, um, you know, a, a tiny circuit board you know, in the manufacturing process or, or things like that, it's very cheap and it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't have to drastically change anything. You know, whereas torque meters and things like that, you've got to design them in from the, um, you know, from the, from the very beginning and they can affect the operational characteristics. So more and more we're seeing these fleets of simple sensors, you know, microphones, cameras, um, accelerometers, uh, you know, pressure sensors, things like that, which, you know, basically anything you can put in a smartphone, um, you know, people are even sending smartphones into space 
now because it's kind of the cheapest and lightest computer that you can get here, which can do interesting things. And so the analysis of that data, which is not directly linked to the problem, it's, you know, you've got to understand the sound, where it's coming from and things like that. AI is very good at that kind of thing. And so, you know, those companies there are almost certainly using AI. And especially when you want to do things like train it on a particular wind farm, your algorithms, but then install it on a wind farm somewhere else, you know, with different birds in the background or something like that, um, you know, that's where you can use AI in order to avoid the whole thing being tripped up if you, you know, train the um, you know, frequency filters or something like that. Uh, you know, it's easy to just get them wrong and have it make the wrong kinds of predictions. So AI, you know, in that third case there, in the predictive maintenance, AI is uh, very applicable. And there's, um, you know, it's something which is being more and more used uh, to, um, you know, to, to provide non-intrusive um, uh, ability to do predictive maintenance non-intrusively. So, you know, without modifying shaft, without embedding sensors, uh, without... Um, you know, needing to upgrade the 1970s SCADA system or things like that. <laughs> yeah, so that ties in well to Philip Sheridan's question, do they mount strain gauges on the blades or tower? And the answer to that is no, not unless they're specifically looking for something. So I used to work designing um, blade heating systems to get rid of ice off, off blades in cold climates. And when I had a new product, uh, we would put some prototypes up and they would have sensors all over them. But um, they don't do that for the, you know, if you sell a whole wind farm with the technology, um, um, mature technology, you, you don't do that then because one, it costs money. Two, it's labor to monitor the data. You know, it's not enough to, to get the data. You have to do something with it. And um, it isn't as easy to use data um, in the control as you would think. Um, and then the third thing is that they sometimes actually affect the performance of the blade. Like I used to use these ice detection and temperature sensors that would go on the outside of the blade surface. They were only like a millimeter, maybe two millimeters thick and like, um, like yeah, like an A5, this sort of size. Um, and I remember installing them on a, um, a prototype one time and I had to promise to take them off again uh, a year later because they were worried about the aerodynamic performance of the you know, just one or two millimeters sticking up. So, yeah, I would say if you had a specific worry about uh, a new a new kind of blade, then you might put a strain gauge on. But usually they do all that instrumentation on a test blade and they, they test it um, in a test hole on the ground and monitor all that. And you see the blades and, you know, they look like Frankenstein's monster. They've got so many wires <laughs> coming off them. I mean, you just couldn't operate a, a real, real turbine like that. Um, another question it, from Paul. Oh, sorry. I, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that we go to this question. This is a this is a really good oh. one. Okay. Well, you can read it then. Yeah. So Paul is asking: Is the SCADA data generally shared for independent analysis and crowdsourcing theories are seen across cases? Uh, so all people who do AI wish that that was the case. Uh, there are data sets that are available. But typically, most companies see, you know, they see data as being like money, which is sitting in the bank, which they can, you know, just go and spend at some point, right? Um, you know, I, I don't really see it like that. I see them more as, um, uh, you know, in the best case, it's kind of, um, you know, artwork, which why keep it locked up to yourself when you could put it in your museum where everyone could see it? Or in, in the other case, you know, it's dangerous because it, you know, potentially it could be leaked or things like that. Um, but you know, generally, uh, the other thing is that most manufacturers, they use, you know, it's becoming more and more a part of the business model, unfortunately. I don't know if you've heard about the, um, you know, for example, in farm equipment, uh, tractors won't run without this, in, they have this incredible suite of sensors and data collection and things like that. They'll go straight to the company that manufactured the tractor. And you actually have to buy a subscription to their data product in order to keep your, 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 your tractor running. And they consider that a huge competitive advantage. Their extra sensors that they have, their historical data set that only they have and things like that. So it's very much not, I think it's vastly overrated. I think actually the goodwill they lose uh, in a lot of cases is 
you know, they, they overestimate the, the value of the asset by 10, 100,000 times and they lose goodwill on it. But certainly the ethos in the research for AI, the ethos is open data. Uh, and so, uh, but in terms of real world data sets that come from you know, interesting things like real turbines in a real wind farm, it's not just a, you know, a university experiment where they installed three turbines for, for a month on a roof or something like that. Very, very hard to, to come by. And often, that's why a lot of people go to work for companies, uh, you know, large consulting companies, because they actually get to access these interesting data sets they wouldn't otherwise. Otherwise, people do simulations. And it's a mm -hmm. super interesting part of AI is doing simulations and learning something from simulation which works in the real world. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like um, a perpetual motion machine, you know, to, to some extent. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the ethos is definitely not there in terms of uh, sharing the data in almost all uh, all industries. Yeah, the wind turbine industry is so secretive. There's no way you're getting any real data uh, there. It's hard enough when you work for the company to get people to hand over their data, and you know they're asking you the specific parameters that you that you want. They won't um, they won't just give you a, a dump of, of everything. That's for sure. But um, I, I think maybe community wind farms. There's a few community wind farms around. That might be a possibility to get some data. And I am planning um, to visit one soon. And I'm, I'm making a mental note to to ask ask if they, if they have some data available because it's something I get asked about quite a lot actually people who are keen on um, seeing some data even just you know good um, weather data uh, wind, wind speed measurements and directions and stuff um, it's not so easily available okay so there's just some cool questions um, maybe slightly off topic but we can finish on um, kind of I think are interesting questions to ask Jeremy anyway so um, have have we seen a oh no this Commenter BK Nesheim has seen AI used to detect pulse and breathing from a standard video signal, and something could also be used on windmill blades. That's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. I, and it's interesting that it's not actually AI. The uh, you know, what those algorithms do is they do something called a Fourier analysis on the video signal, which basically turns it into a frequency signal. And then they accentuate the frequencies, which are you know, in the range of breathing or pulse rates. And then they recreate the video. You can do it in backwards afterwards. And what happens is that you see you know, the skin changes lightly uh, as the pulse goes. By accentuating, you see the skin you know, change a lot. And the breathing, you know, it changes very slightly, the posture. You see that being amplified. So it's, it's barely an AI algorithm at all. It's really just a simple algorithm called a Fourier transform, uh, but applied in a really interesting way. Um, but yeah, that kind of thing there, a lot of the, uh, you know, the main uh, mathematical operation, which is used in deep learning, which is called a convolution. A convolution is actually equivalent to doing a Fourier transform uh, and then doing a, a simple um, uh, a simple product, and then doing an inverse Fourier transform. So to some extent, um, you know, the two are very related mathematically. Um, but you know, by using these deep learning algorithms, you essentially get the possibility of you know, exploiting that kind of information. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm from Doctor Who, who is one of the the first Engineering with Rosie viewers from back when I had about ten viewers per video. So hi, Doctor Who. Um, he says, check out David Eagleman's sensory vest. He's working on a method where a pilot can feel the status of an aircraft instead of looking at gauges. Imagine a sensory vest that lets you feel the status of a wind turbine. And based on some of the um, technologies that I have developed and how well they go in their very first iteration, I do not like the idea that I would be wearing <laughs> wearing a vest that let me feel the, the status of my product. Well, on the other hand, when whenever you sit on a bike, you feel the the status of the road, you know, the, of how rough the road is and things like that. So it, it doesn't seem like a particularly bad idea to me. You just have to make sure that it's uh, you know, it's done in a way which is not going to distract the person too much, or it, it is actually going to provide useful information. <laughs> Yeah, I think it sounds really cool for, for flying, especially some of the um, complicated modern aircrafts. Okay, we'll just do a few more questions and then we'll have to wrap up. But, um, so 
Department of Energy could produce an open wind turbine data set and definitely within where rumored, so why haven't they? And there are a few US government, actually when I was doing my PhD, the US government was the source of like nearly everything good that I could find came from them. So there's NREL and I don't know if it's Sandia or Sandia um, Laboratory. They have they have a lot of stuff, but it's either simulations, like Jeremy was saying, or it's one one turbine that they instrumented so um and not it's not operated in a commercial way either so there is this like disjoint in the wind industry between the academics and the um operational stuff and it's it's not always quite quite the same but yeah 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 and i think the a lot of the interesting data sets you know somewhat paradoxically come from the darpa uh the defense advanced research projects agency uh, in the US, uh, you know, they have that remit to seed things uh, by creating competitions, data sets or things like that, that will eventually lead to capabilities they think they'll need further down the road. I think the remit of the Department of Energy is a little bit, uh, they try to, at least from what I understand, I'm no expert here, I think they try to fill in gaps that aren't already met by the the commercial um the, you know, the commercial sector and so you know given that uh you know you look at for example uh, ge they have vast amounts of wind turbine data not just wind turbine also you know uh, jet engine turbine and all kinds of turbine data that that they have access to um yeah, I think the because of that, they feel you know that there's less of an impetus to do it. Like mostly, those kinds of agencies avoid treading on the toes of the companies that are operating, especially where there's an American company that's kind of a champion in the industry. Uh, they avoid doing that in order to you know avoid uh, seeding competitors to them. And so, yeah, you know, I I think um, it's a great idea. And you know, governments are getting a lot more open. You know, Barack Obama uh, had an open data commissioner who was the first uh, uh, person to actually you know, hire someone whose explicit role was to to do that. And open data initiatives are, are, are starting to happen. But that would involve something very different, which is saying that data even produced by a private company is to some extent a, a, a public good and certainly yeah, I, we see more of that in some parts of Europe and other parts of the world, but certainly in North America, uh, culturally, it's far from being able to happen, I think. Hmm. That's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't think of it in that way. All right, I'm just going to pick this as a final comment um, for Jeremy to comment on from Paul Boswick. Seems like a deep issue on AI is a naturally backward looking nature of it. You can mostly see only things you plan to see. What do you say to that, Jeremy? Yeah, that's exactly true. Um, AI, when you train the algorithm, you train it on data, which you say represents the entire world. Uh, and so if you want the algorithm to do something which isn't in the data set, it's possible to do it, but it requires a huge amount of expertise and effort, and most people don't do that. So you know, AI, which is used simply, is absolutely backward looking. Uh, and that's simply because you know, there's a basic principle of AI, which is a no free lunch principle. And that is that you can't learn anything unless you make assumptions um, to enable the system to be biased. And most people bias the system entirely by the data, which is, uh, which is put in. They say this data represents the entire world. And uh, there's nothing which says a system can't make a prediction totally off, even in slightly different places. You see that over and over and over. So you know, the other thing about um, you know backward-looking nature is that you know, in the end, when you create an AI system, what you're really doing is you're saying, I have a hypothesis that this data here is representative of the system, and that by training this model in a particular way, I can create a predictor, which it will be representative of the future behavior of the system, right? That's a hypothesis. And you can't forward test that hypothesis when you train it, you can only back test it. And so to have a forward uh, looking ability, you have to design that into the system. You have to design ways in order to make that happen. That's part of the, you know, that's part of the, I would say the more advanced um, practitioner of AI 
data science, uh, the way people do it is typically they don't think through those things as much. But when you, you know, when you go deep into it, you can, even things like causality, you can start to untangle with AI. But certainly, um, if you just do it naively, it, you're absolutely right, Paul. It's, uh, it's totally backward looking. And you can make really no uh, guarantees about the future behavior of the system. Uh, all you can do is say that, well, if the data was the same as it was in the past, which almost never is, it'll give probably similar things, but, you know, probably, except sometimes it won't, but, you know, we won't talk about those too much. And, uh, you know, the art of AI is really being able to make stronger statements about the system um, than that very weak statement, which is what you get by default out of the box. Yeah. Okay, that was a good one to end on. So I just need to thank again WeatherGuard Lightning Tech for sponsoring this live stream. Um, WeatherGuard makes strike tape, which is a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast like wind turbines and um, aeroplane wings. So uh, I also do a podcast with uh, WeatherGuard, so you can check out the link in the description. Last week we talked about um, wind turbine blade aerodynamics, including how vortex generators work um, and other blade uh, aerodynamic upgrades. And we also discussed new migratory bird laws in the US, um, undersea exploration tech and a collapsed Nordex turbine in Germany. So check out the, that podcast in the link. Thanks also to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team who um, always suggest uh, questions and topics um, for the live streams and for you know future videos. So if you want to join the team and support the channel's growth um, and help steer the direction of the channel, um, and also we have a Patreon-only Discord server now, so you can find the link to join us in the description also. And, of course, the biggest thank you to Jeremy for joining us today and uh, sharing his insights on artificial intelligence. And um, I hope that Jeremy is going to, well, I hope that you had fun today, Jeremy. And if you did, then I hope that you will agree to join us again another time for some of those other AI-related topics that have, have come up that I'd like to talk about more. It's a date. <laughs> awesome. So thanks also to everybody that, um, that's been watching and to all the comments. Um, yeah, it, you're the reason that, you know, we can have a live stream and why it can be interactive. So thanks a lot. And we'll see you in the next one in a couple of weeks. I think I'm probably going to do it on like groups of wind turbines. I don't know um, what the collective noun for a group of wind turbines is like a pod or a school or a flock or or what but i've seen a few news articles recently about um yeah grouping wind turbines together so i think that might be the next topic in a couple of weeks all right see you thanks everyone